All right, One Piece chapter 1086. Let's get it. No cover page, just a dope ass cover spread. Look at Frankie. <laughs> chapter 1086, The Five Elders. It starts off with a beautiful panel of Pangea Castle. Igarapur and Pell are looking for Vivi and Cobra. Now on the ships of the monarchs returning home, some stowaways hold their breath. Who are these stowaways? The first two are Vivi and Wapple, of course. You know, Wapple asks Vivi like, hey, what country ship is this? And Vivi's like, this is the Aegis Kingdom. And he tells Big News Morgan and Big News Morgan tells him like, tells him, hey, yo, I'm gonna get up on that ship. I'm gonna claim it's a false ass interview, yada, yada, yada. And that's when you goofy ass motherfuckers sneak onto my ship and don't get fucking caught, yerd. And Big News is excited. He knows that this might be a juicy ass story. VV asks Wapo, like, hey, what'd you see at the reverie? And he's like, I can't tell you that shit. They're gonna fucking kill your ass if I tell you. And Vivi's like, all right, then. Let me use that then, then. Call my pops. And Wapo's like, nah, hell no. Vivi's like, why? Um, he's busy. Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> he don't want to tell her. He don't want to tell her that fucking what happened to Cobra. <laughs> In the next panel, show some cypher pole agents looking for Sabo and Vivi. Look at Steli. <laughs> You're gonna piss off Sanji looking at Vivi like that, boy. Boy's gonna fucking kick you into another dimension. Quit playing. And the next panel shows Bonnie as a stowaway on the Tangine Kingdom ship and Sabo on the Lulucia ship. He's on that ship and he thinks about Cobra's last moments. Where that motherfucker got got. That boy got got, bro, for real. And of course, news of the murder of Cobra and the disappearance of Vivi spreads. Back at Mary Joie, the five elders talk about Sabo and how he has a checkered fate as well. You know, Sabo is surrounded by so many Ds. <laughs> and that's when Emu calls him on the den den and tells him that he or she, she, whatever the fuck Emu is, he tells him that he wants to use the weapon created by Vegapunk, the Mother Flame. Now, more thoughts on this on the final thoughts section at the end. And the five elders talk about it and how they need to test it. And Emu's like, shit, test it on Lucia, shit. There's a target right there. And the Goro says like, but there's a lot of people. And Emu's like, I don't give a fuck. You heard what the fuck I said? You oh, shut bro, the fuck up when I'm talking to you, boy. Oh, Bitch right. made boy. Oh, bitch made boy. And of course the girls say get the message. You know what I'm saying? They're like, all right, we got it. Say less. And then they ask, why Lucia though? And Emu responds, it's close. Now, does this imply that the weapon can only be used at close range? Who the fuck knows? Maybe she's like, hey, it's the closest target. You just pick that one, fuck it, let's go. Now for the panel that shows the five elders from right to left. First, we got St. J. Garcia Saturn, military god of scientific defense. Could this be the reason why he's headed to Egghead? Makes a lot of sense. Scientific defense, of course. Next, we got St. Marcus Mars, military god of environment. Next, we got St. Topman Walkery, aka Mercury, military god of law. Next to him, we got St. Ethan Baron V. Nasuro Joro. That's a fucking mouthful. Jesus Christ. Of course, this is Venus, military god of finance. Then, last, we got Saint Shepherd Jupiter. You know, Jupiter. Now, this one is kind of particular. All the other ones say military god, but on this panel, this one refers to him as a warrior god of agriculture so i thought that was kind of crazy emu tells him that he slash she whatever wants a vv she's like i fucking want that fucking goofy ass broad bring her to me now god damn it next panel shows marine q get news that the tangine and the aegis kingdom have started rebellions now remember bonnie is on the tangine ship she's a stowaway on that ship in the aegis kingdom is where Vivi and Wobble are. 
And of course, Lulucia started rebellion. And that's the ship that Sabo was on the show. They all picked the right ships, I guess. One Piece, let's go. Now the next panel shows the Seraphim being deployed. And they show three new Seraphim that we haven't seen yet. They show Doflamingo Seraphim, Morias, and Crocodiles. And I like how Crocodiles also has the same scar that Crocodile has on his face. Now theories have come out saying that maybe it's a requirement to become a Shichibukai, you have to give your DNA to the world government. But that's neither here nor there. Let's get it. Sabo tells Ivankov and Dragon that when he arrived at Lulu, he saw the king of Lucia, King Seki, and Princess Komain get captured. And because he was a stowaway, they just welcomed him with open arms. And that's when he saw a newspaper and he found out that he had been framed for Cobra's murder. He also says that there are many people from Lucia that wanted to join the Revolutionary Army. And those are the people he brought back. And then they talk about what happened at Lulucia. Sabo says that he couldn't find a jamming transponder, but as soon as they set sail from Lulucia, he made an indirect call. So even if the world government had intercepted it, it would look like he was still back at the island. Now Ivanka asks him what exactly happened to Lulucia. And Sabo tells him it was complete chaos that day. The people of Lulucia saw their home get obliterated. And Drag's like, what the fuck happened? Tell us, damn it. Sabo tells them a huge shadow covered the sky. And then, boom. Lulucia was gone. It was wiped away instantly. And Dragon's like, a oh, huge shadow? He's fucking shocked. It kind of sounds like Dragon might know something about this. Who knows? That's what I took from it. Maybe he knows something about this. If this is Vegapunk's doing, he has very close ties to Vegapunk, so he could know exactly what the fuck it is. Who knows? Sabo explains that he couldn't tell if it was a living thing or something that was naturally occurring. He says that there was something pitch black flying above the clouds. Now for some more juicy shit. You guys ready? Ivankov says that 800 years ago, one of the first 20 kings was called Saint Emu from the Nerona family. The Nerona family. Ivankov also talks about the ability to make somebody immortal. And that implies that there is somebody in the world that's immortal and cannot die. High possibility that it's Emu. Even Sabo thinks so. Ivankov says, even if it's a coincidence, it's alarming that these five elder gods, the self-proclaimed descendants of the gods, bow to this person, the same person that Sabo saw in that room. Ivankov also states that nobody other than Vegapunk could have created the weapon that destroyed Lulucia. Of course, Dragon defends Vegapunk. He knows Vegapunk would never create a weapon of mass murder, especially for the world government. And of course, Ivankov knows this as well. Then they speculate that maybe it could be an ancient weapon because Robin did give him information when she was running with him. But they also question why use it now? If they've always had it in their possession, why use it now? Now for the final panel. This one's got every fucking body hyped. It shows the Supreme Commander of the Holy Knights, Saint Figulin Garling, and he is responsible for the execution of Saint Don Quixote Josgard. That boy dead, dead, man. That boy gone. R.I.P., my man. R.I.P. Real shit. He was a real one. And Joe's guy was killed because he stood up for the fishman in the incident that happened with Shira Hoshi. Couple more things about this panel before my final thoughts. The first was, the first is this guy's haircut. This whole crescent moon hairdo. Frankie would be proud. More more thoughts on Frankie and this guy in, in the final thoughts. But I want to see if the other Holy Knights have a whole crescent moon thing. 
to them as well, honestly. I wouldn't be surprised. Second thing, the panel addresses that this moment is very groundbreaking because whoever this person is, this person is so powerful that they could pass judgment on a celestial dragon. This is world breaking. And the last thing about this panel is that it mentioned that this man was the former king of God Valley. Wow. Final thoughts. This one was a pure hype bomb. But first, hold on. All right, had to, you know, had to readjust myself a little bit. But yeah, Oda definitely sprinkled the little fucking hype seasonings and shit. The three things that stood out to me in this chapter was number one, this whole emu being from the Nerona family, you know? I like right when I heard that name, I was like, Nerona, these one pieces are gonna go, what yo? Nerona, Perona, they're gonna dissect all that shit. Anybody with a similar sounding name, there is going to be theories about them. Promise you. Especially Perona. <laughs> Perona, Nerona, Shabona. <laughs> Uh, the second thing, the second, the second thing that stood out to me was this whole mother flame shit. This whole mother flame slash Vegapunk slash ancient weapon ordeal that stood out to me. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. The third thing that stood out to me was this whole St. Fig Garlic, you know. Or garlic. We call him Crescent Moon Garlic Man. That's what me and the homies have been calling him. Crescent Moon Garlic Man. But uh, Oda, know, Oda knows what he was doing by having him at the end of the chapter, at the final panel. You know, he knew what he was doing. He's like, here you go, guys. All right, let's go. Four week break. Got to get the fuck out of here. I'll see you guys in four weeks. Let's get it. So... And the fact that he was fucking executing a celestial dragon. Yikes. So I asked a couple of my uh, Nakamas over there at the last arc, you know, their thoughts about a couple of this stuff. So shout outs to those guys over there. Shout out to Den Den the Legend. Shout out to Straw Hat Lucas, you know. And they told me their thoughts. And I appreciate you guys so much for just telling me your thoughts and stuff like that. I really do because I... You guys are whizzes at this shit, man. You guys are fucking whizzes at this. Wizards. Um, I want to jumble them all up. Like, their thoughts, I want to jumble them up. And I kind of want to pose them as what ifs. Not just theories, but like what ifs, you know. I, I like to plant seeds too, people, you know what I mean? To me, there's nothing more powerful than an idea, honestly. An idea, a thought, those things are fucking truly powerful. But let's get into that shit, yo. So first, I want to talk about Saint Figulin, right? It's a common theory that it's a common theory he has ties with Shanks. You know, the Figulin family with their whole last name and all this good stuff. It's a common theory that this might be Shanks' father, uncle, grandfather, something along the lines. It's a common theory. And Especially that they mentioned that he was a former king of the God Valley, you know, and it's common speculation that Shanks had a lot to do with that event, whatever happened there. It's pretty like pretty much common sense that Shanks had a lot to do with the whole God Valley thing. So now here's a couple what ifs. What if he has connections to Dr. Kareha and Frankie? You're like, Frankie, what? Shout out, shout out Straw Hat Lucas for this one. <laughs> this was crazy. The more I thought of it, I'm like, yikes, he might have connections. Well, first, the Dr. Kareha thing, right? It's popular theory that God Valley was a place where evil experiments took place. Evil scientific experiments took place, right? Now, what happened at God Valley may be... I said, I brought up Shanks. Maybe Shanks could have been a part of that. Maybe some of those evil experiments they were planning to do on a baby. Whether it was transform him somehow or 
give him some type of powers. Maybe that's the whole reason the God Valley incident took place was to save a uh, baby Shanks. I don't know. But the reason why I bring up Dr. Kreha is because this panel, this close-up panel of St. Fig looks eerily similar to Dr. Kreha. Now, also, like, just to bring in some more scientific stuff, like, I honestly believe that Mads has more members, right? And I also believe that Dr. Kareha could have been one, you know. Something about the Mads, a shout out to Cube for mentioning this, but the, all the Mads scientists, they all have these little glasses, these little rock star glasses and shit. So maybe this guy could have been one. He does have those glasses right there. But now let's talk about some Frankie connections. First, I mean, look, I mentioned earlier, look at this boy's hair. Like, it's something like Frankie would rock, right? Like, this is... And then also with Frankie, he has a lot of ties to scientific things, too. You know what I mean? This big speculation that Frankie boat that he found was the abandoned Mads boat. That's a giant crackpot theory. Like, he, he ran into the... like. To save himself, he found the abandoned Mads boat and used all the technology from that boat. A.K.A. Dr. Vegapunk technology. All of, a lot of this ties in, right? So that's the first thing was St. Fig's hair. Now some more Frankie stuff, right? The Frankie connections come back when they talk about the mother flame. And I thought it was... Shout out to Straw Hat Lucas... For pointing out, like, the way it was spelled was very weird. Flame, like, F-L-A-I-M. Like, it sounds a lot like Flam, Cuddy Flam. That's Frankie's original name, Cuddy Flam. Now, here's some more what-ifs and some more connections, right? Shout out to Denon for this. What if the Mother Flame was the source or power that Emo used to power up Egghead. And that's how she got Dr. Vegapunk to help the world government. And maybe that's how she got Dr. Vegapunk to create the Sky Weapon itself. And of course, maybe he created it with another purpose, but like a lot of technology, it was used for bad. It was used for mass murder. Now, then then also brought up another thing about Mother Flame. The Mother Flame. Dragon and Ivankov asked themselves, like, why would they be using it now? All of a sudden, why would Emu and the world government be using the Mother Flame right now? And maybe they have to use it sparingly. A flame, and you think about it, she has, or he or she has, Cellars down at the bottom of Mary Joa that keep everything cold. It was very cold in there. It was very cold. And what if using this mother flame somehow thaws that area out somehow? Whatever she's keeping down there. Because I'm pretty sure it's not just this giant straw hat that's down there. Now for a little bit of my crackpot theories, alright? This is like the, the things that I thought about and the things that about this chapter that intrigued me and I want to make some connections, right? So the first thing that I thought about when I heard Mother Flame was Mother Ship. And I have this ginormous theory that the weapon that destroyed Lucia was a UFO or some type of UFO. I, I definitely know that UFOs will come into the play. Mark my words, you guys. Space peace is upon us. But... Mothership, UFO, and then I started thinking about all, like, I'm a big, like, ancient aliens watcher and all this on History Channel, so there are countless times in history where UFOs have been described as emitting a flame, and there have been countless tales of dragons throughout the ancient times, and if you guys ever watch Ancient Aliens, they tie the two together, right? Basically meaning all the stories they talked about dragons emitting flames, those could have been UFOs. A flying serpent shooting out flames could have been a vehicle that they saw that they thought was a dragon, but really was a UFO, an, you know, an ancient astronaut as they call it. Maybe Otis playing a lot with that stuff. 
Maybe, and also, he's also, maybe he's trying to tie in, if you guys ever researched about the tales of the Anunnaki, how they genetically modify us humans to dig for their gold. Now, just to talk about a little bit about the UFOs and dragons and stuff, I found it very interesting that in this chapter, when Sabo is talking about the sky weapon, who has the most shocked reaction in the chapter? Dragon. You know? Dragon. He was like a giant shadow. <laughs> when is he ever like that? When is he ever like, oh my god, what? Never see Dragon shocked or shook. He's just like... Okay, look, I can go on about UFOs forever, but I want to talk about a couple more things before I wrap this up. I'm just trying to plant seeds or whatever, so... This, I thought also about when I heard the when I heard the mother flame thing, I also thought about a particular thing. And I thought about the Olympic flame, right? The flame that sits on top of Mount Olympus. And in Mount I was like Mount Olympus. What was what is Mount Olympus in one piece? The red line. Who, who lived on top of the red line? The Lunarians, who had a flame on their back. Could this mother flame have any ties to the Lunarians, right? Could they, oh man, I, I just, my mind can go crazy off these fucking thoughts, man, off One Piece. You guys know what I'm talking about. Like, it's, it fucking enters your mind and it just takes over shit. But I just want to mention one more thing that I found interesting. Kind of ties the it kind of ties the UFO and Lunarian thing, and the Mother Flame thing. Kind of just more thought, more food for thought. Right? In this last anime episode where Zoro fights King, the finale what was it a thousand ten sixty two? Don't mark me on this, but it was, a, it was it just came out, guys. I ain't trying to spoil you guys. If you if you haven't seen the episode yet, get away from this. Click off the video, but hit that like button before you do. In that episode, I found it so funny that King, when King is fighting Zoro, he uses an, he uses an attack that makes him look like a fucking UFO. He uses a spin attack. And when I seen that, I was like, oh, shit, it looks like a UFO. That's dope. And then all this shit came. Oh, man, all this is crazy. I, my mind is going wild off the UFO theories now, man. UFO piece, let's go.